right, everybody, welcome back to another OpenShift Commons briefing with the the good folks from the GTO office. We have Andrew Clay Schaefer here with us and uh, John Alspa from Adaptive Capacity Labs um, and other incantations of himself. And today we're going to talk about learning from incident, which incidents. I, it's incidents. Uh, okay. Incident. I wish we could. Only, I wish we could only have one. Only one incident. Yes. Well, zero accidents this week in my household. How about yours? Uh, so I'm going to let Andrew and John introduce themselves, and um, we're going to have a, a rolling conversation here today. So no slides, um, and go for it. Andrew, take it away. Yeah, so I've talked to you before, and I'm not sure I want to talk too much about myself, but I will talk about myself a little bit to introduce John. So the, the thoughts that I have you know, around some of the things regarding DevOps and operations were definitely influenced by th this man, John Alspa, and the way that, you know, he, he got to be part of some some very, we'll call them uh, generative projects and, and gave a talk that I would say essentially gave DevOps the, the movement its name. So there's this famous talk from Velocity Conference where John Alspa and Paul Hammond talked about DevOps cooperation at Flickr and that, that like, chain into a bunch of other things, led to a bunch of conversations about DevOps. He was a big part of Blossy Conference. He also wrote some books, and now he's really focused on and very passionate about the, this notion of, of learning from incidents and, and human factors, and I'll let him introduce himself a bit more, and then we'll chat about that. <laughs> uh, thank you, sir, Andrew. Um, uh, yeah, I mean that's 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 a great intro. I have to say that I've learned as much from you, Andrew, as um, as you might uh, um, have learned from me. Um, uh, yeah, that that's that's about right. Um, and uh, really, at the highest level, is uh, on on my mind and my colleagues' mind are introducing new ways of looking at how work gets done. And one of the most sort of effective ways of looking at how work gets done can be can be seen by looking closely at incidents. Um, so just so, really quick, yeah. not not necessarily as a pitch, but explain what you do at adaptive capacity, and I'll kind of lay the sure, sure, yeah. And so so what what we do at adaptive capacity labs is. Uh, is help organizations, it's a, a small um, consulting group, help organizations understand how they learn from incidents currently, um, who learns, where that learning uh, travels or, 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 or dissipates, um, and, uh, and how to, um, how to uh, glean more and richer uh, understandings of their incidents. Um, to help them do what they're already doing, but tends to go uh, sort of unnoticed, and that is preventing incidents. Um, and uh, a great deal of doing this work means um, bringing a, uh, a sort of a host of pretty particular techniques from other, um, from research into uh, human factors and cognitive work in other domains. Um, but none of those techniques and methods are you know, new they're just new to being applied in the in the software domain um, in in the way that we do that from time to time uh, worth mentioning from time to time organizations will experience a significant event um, something that's really visible so it's sometimes advantageous for um, for them to hire us to do the analysis ourselves a really bad oversimplification but we're going to say it anyway uh, is um, you could think of one of the things that we do is you, you've heard of the NTSB uh, in, in, in the US um, whose, whose role is accident investigation in aviation um, and, and other transportation um, fields. You can think of adaptive capacity labs as helping build uh, a, you know, mini NTSB expert, you know, a cadre of people inside your organization who have NTSB like skills and expertise um, that they currently don't have. That's a so, short way so of saying. Let's re reify this a bit. When we say incident, what we're talking about is the the website is down or or yeah, something along. These I don't lines. I, I don't know actually as as it turns out, and I, maybe what you've um, 
teed up for me here in, in an incredibly veiled way is that it turns out the definition of incident is not as crisp and uh, and uh, standard and clear as, as we might think. Um, uh, as we know from looking at real incidents, um, incidents don't always show up with a big label on their forehead that says, I'm an incident. Even part, even even working out whether a thing is an incident, it can be of, of a interest. Few, a few weeks ago, uh, Kat Switel uh, was on talking um, on another one of these sessions, and she brought up the uh, a slide that had a picture of like in a factory floor of you know zero incidents in the past you know 365 days or an event, and basically uh, the anecdote she was telling was. Whenever she saw something like that, it panicked her a bit because yeah. that meant they weren't watching for something or they were missing something because there's just like really no way that there wasn't something that they could learn from from these incidents. And so I think the definition of incidents is um, has lots of different semantic meanings in, in different ways. So I think that's a, a key piece of the conversation. Indeed. Um, I don't know where you want to go with it, John, but keying off that, and this notion of what considered an incident is also, in some cases, a question of blame, right? So, so like, or attribution, causation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I know you have lots of thoughts on this. So maybe you could, uh, yeah. you could give us a little, a little monologue about about some of these things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, first, that I think I actually, I actually like what Diane had had brought up, and so I'll, 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 um, I'll, I'll riff from from that vantage point. Um, so, you know, like I mentioned before, um, a lot of what we do uh, is um, bringing new perspectives uh, to uh, understanding what makes work hard and what makes people good at it and what makes them, uh, what could potentially either support or hinder their ability to, 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 to do work. Um, uh, the majority of, uh, um, of the techniques and, 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 and perspectives come from uh, sometimes called safety critical domains, like power plants and, 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 um, and medicine and military and uh, transportation, all that sort of stuff. Um, we have to remember that categorizing, uh, remember even declaring a thing, uh, a thing that happened, an event, um, as an incident, right? Labeling it as an incident is itself a categorization. Um, the notion that, um, that, a, uh, that there's really only two, um, it sounds cartoonish, well, at least I hope it sounds cartoonish to a lot of, um, a lot of the, uh, uh, the viewers here, um, but quite often you'll hear, okay, in the, in the wake of a, an, an accident, you say, okay, well, is this a result of human error? or technical failure, right? For whatever reason, um, the uh, um, uh, journalists, one, one, just one of those two categories. The, um, that frame that um, what makes an incident, what makes not an incident is sort of beyond the scope of, of this, but as a bit of a trivia, uh, a man named Heinrich in the early 1900s uh, uh, put together this notion that you could characterize, and and by that even declaring a thing an incident or not, and even human error or technical failure, um, uh, and that was his sort of contribution. What's not often brought up is that he um, is that uh, he worked in an insurance company, and so having a perspective on a categorization is a political as much as, you know, uh, genuine curiosity. What stems from this is exactly what you, what, what, what you just mentioned, um, Andrew, which is, uh, um, which is blame. And blame certainly gets a lot of attention because it's sort of palpable. It's, a, it's um, uh, telling the story of human error or making it about the individual attributions of a particular person. This is the, the, the you know, the, the root cause was Stephen, right, or something along those lines, is really just a special version of Stephen again. Uh, yes, yeah, Stephen again, exactly. And Lisa had to bail him out once more. Um, the uh, um, 
the the notion that we have uncertainty and in that matter sort of an uncomfortability uh, in the wake of an accident, an accident, uh, meaning a thing that has some form of surprise and, and adverse, you know, effects or, or whatever. Um, to think, one, because that came out of nowhere, otherwise it wouldn't be a surprise, in some way it came out of nowhere, right? Um, but to, to, to admit that those things in the future uh, are possible and uh, and the sort of ever-present dread that they can't all be anticipated means that we have to put this sort of fear, this general, like, oh my God, how can I feel good about the future, even if it's a lie? I'd rather feel good, right? Um, and so where can I place this, this we, tension? In the case of blame, I can put it in. We get uncomfortable with uncertainty. Yeah, well, it's a, it, yes, exactly. And in, in particular, we want a place of, you know, we want to hold up a totem or some some form of, just put a place, you know, scapegoating, pile the sins of the the, the village on the back of the of the goat and send send the goat out of the out of town, right? Is the way. So we need we need to put it in a box. Notice I didn't say container. Um, <laughs> we have to put it in a box, um, and and sometimes that box is embodied in a person. Sometimes it's in a really big, vague, it's in the system, man. Uh, or sometimes it's in uh, our, your cloud vendor, or you know, as long as there's a, if there's a place to put the uncertainty, the, 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 the underpinning of this is the developing an understanding of the incident. So uh, can be. Yeah, aren't you missing just a little piece though, because, or, or I'm sure you're not missing it, but because there's always that phrase that uh, failure is where the innovation comes from. Um, so by when we put things in a box or a you know container, whatever. Well, and, failure yeah. is also where you stop uh, looking, in a yeah. sense. I, I want to make one quick comment that, that I think might help the listeners, which is John and I have spent hours and hours talking about some of these things over the last ten years, and and I think that there's it, it, it's in our best interest to articulate that these quote unquote systems are, are neither human nor technical, it's socio-technical, both of those things together. And then also add, and I, I think this is relevant to the OpenShift community, there is no organization on the planet running any of these systems that thinks that the systems themselves are, are fully autonomous. And that and that their their reliability is not dependent on the the actions of those those human uh, entities and agents to keep the reliability. Yes, yes, well said. I think we've probably been we've probably spoken on the order of days, Andrew, on these topics over the years um, in total. Um, We're yeah, getting old. Uh, also getting old. Yes, we are. Um, yeah, and 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 uh, um, you know, a, a big part of taking a uh, you know taking some of these perspectives um, uh, can be somewhat mind flipping, actually. So, Diane, you mentioned you know you said something about you know uh, failure is sort of where innovation happens, uh, which is which is undeniable. Um, one of the things that uh, that I've that I've come to understand in a really deep way is something that's quite um, uh, unintuitive, which is that um, which is that success is you know understanding how people are just plain doing their work it can also be a, um, a significant source of innovation, right? You can think of many products uh, in the world, very you know, uh, um, uh, very successful businesses that um, uh, that turned a product turned uh, a what was otherwise a workaround in a previous product into uh, a significant um, and really groundbreaking service. I think of CDNs; it's a great example of uh, of that. Um, uh, and so, um, but the difficulty, and this is the difficulty with the field of resilience engineering, is 
is that you have to, um, you know, I can't just say, all right, everybody, at the end of the day, let's get together and let's talk about all of the ways that the site could have gone down, but didn't, right? Mm -hmm. um, because there's not enough time. The next, we'd be there till the next day. And so, um, uh, and this reflects in the same thing of safety, right? The denominator in, 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 Kat's, uh, um, in Kat's slide, it's a great example. In the world of safety where you see those signs, and those signs actually do, you know, are, are in a number of places. Um, notice the denominator is missing, which is uh, um, one, it takes uh, for, uh, for an account that an incident is, um, all incidents are the same. Um, it also doesn't count how many incidents were prevented. It only shows the ones that were there. And Eric Holnagel has said that when you start measuring things, uh, Holnagel being a, a sort of pioneer of resilience engineering, when you start measuring, when you start uh, um, uh, measuring things by what is not there, you run into some difficulties. Um, uh, you can you can certainly um, prevent a lot of scores on goal, um, but if you're not scoring, then it might not end as well the way the way you think. You but, have a uh, but again, for resilience engineering. Mm -hmm. um, do I have a pithy? Uh, um, okay, yeah, improvised. I would say that resilience engineering is the study of both. Um, uh, currently, is the study of that is to say, adaptive capacity, investments in adaptive capacity, playing out in real world situations standing on grounded and concrete empirical evidence. Resilience engineering, the engineering of resilience uh, stands on understanding what resilience looks like to begin with. It's a field, it's a domain, it's a community. Um, and it's, and it's, uh, it's 20 years old, uh, at least. And, um, uh, but it's only, maybe five years old with software and technology starting to bridge and understand those. Not very pithy. Not very pithy. pithy. I, I think, I mean, one of the interesting, that, like side note is there, there's things that were emerging in practice that were gravitating towards what you just described as a resilience engineering that, that definitely predate the five years that, that you're giving it the label. You're absolutely right. And, um, and that is the thing that was fascinating. The reason why I was able to, you know, when I became first interested in this, did my master's degree and started and, and started continuing reading. Um, when I, uh, you know, when I contacted the heavies in that field, you know, it, I was, it was like Richard Cook and David Woods and Sidney Decker and, and, um, and, and Steve Sharrock and, and, and others. I, uh, so this, is, this should probably have come out in the introduction, but just for the, yeah. for the listener, like yeah. walk, walk through like how you got there. Right. So you, you run, uh, these websites this way, kind of, yeah. kind of tell us a little bit of that arc to where you gravitated towards that field. That sure. Body. Sure. So, so we, um, uh, so I worked at a, a, a photo sharing website called Flickr, as you mentioned. Um, we were um, we were acquired by Yahoo, but for the most part, um, we were sort of our own sort of standalone sort of entity, and we grew in ridiculous ways. I mean, in like cartoonishly uh, atmosphere, like stratosphere ways. Um, we went from being like the twenty fifth most trafficked property at Yahoo to the fifth most trafficked, um, uh, like behind like the front page and mail, right? Um, uh, and in, in like 18 months, um, the complexity of the back end of the, um, of the website, all of the things that made things work kind of exploded. And at some point, uh, you know, I had a team of, um, about six infrastructure engineers. Um, and at some point, it, you know, we had some big outages, some, some pretty significant outages. 
but I couldn't get over the fact that on paper we should have had way more <laughs> and I couldn't understand what that is what's that about and actually some of these you know having been sort of part of responding to some of the incidents after you know you work out the incident and, and all, all incidents can be really harrowing um we just kind of like okay after aftermath okay wow that was bananas that was crazy it's like yeah it's kind of crazy that we even worked out what was happening like yeah and so i couldn't as a manager i was i was thinking to myself okay what's what's going on here either i'm incredibly good at hiring and and like being able to do this work is is sort of innate you're born with it or something or whatever i just happened to you know strike gold with, with the people on my team or they were certainly pretty good and i'm an amazing manager and that's what like so both of those are completely unbelievable um certainly um the latter one would would have been existentially difficult to accept because i had have no idea what i would what i did to make that so I started to under, started to look into like what makes what makes what what are what underpins people's ability to uh, solve a problem, not just to solve a problem, but solve a problem under time pressure, where any of the actions you're taking could could very well make things worse, right, and represent. In, in some, in, in definitely cautionary tales, an existential business, you know, uh, situation. And that's what led me to human factors. And what I understood about human factors is this, you know, field, you know, most of us understand ergonomics. Ergonomics is, is quite often seen to be a uh, sort of a, a, a specialized sort of subset of the field, or if you're in Britain, you'd say that was the field and human factors is the subset. But the, uh, the fact of the matter is where technology, work, and people, you know, um, happen is, is this field. What I, what I realized was something happened in about the 70s and a part of um, uh, human factors, traditional human factors, started to undergo a uh, sort of a, uh, again, an existential sort of, wait a minute, we don't, maybe we we actually don't understand this stuff the way we think. Three Mile Island was the point. The whole, the whole planet um, uh, that was doing human factors work was like, holy crap. No, actually, you can't design a situ, uh, uh, you know, an operations room um, without taking into account the cognitive work, not just like plain old, can you see the dials and all that sort of stuff. And cognitive systems engineering sort of was born. Um, and it's a very, uh, I wouldn't call it a splinter, but certainly it's a, um, it's a, uh, a field in and of itself. Um, Don Norman, Dave Woods, Jens Rasmussen, these are, these are folks that were um, al almost entirely uh, uh, came from nuclear um, uh, research in nuclear power plants, um, but then went on. And to this day, even though resilience engineering as a field, resilience engineering is a, a pretty broad field um, because it's got a lot, it's, it's entirely, there are sociologists, there are operations research, there are statisticians, there's lots of people. A core part uh, at this juncture is uh, cognitive systems engineering. Uh, it's not all of what represents uh, resilience engineering, that's certainly a core part of it. Much like, you know, statistics is a bit of a part of computer science or, you know, and, and mathematics. So these things sort of interrelate. That's a little bit of my, you know, background of how I got there. Uh, and I'm still learning. So <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the gist. What I, the, the, the final thing I'll say is that the, uh, it is much more rewarding. And the thing that I am excited about is that, uh, you know, much like continuous, you know, delivery, continuous deployment, um, the notion, all of the things that we associated with that, both the things that enable it, the rationale for even thinking about, the, thinking about it in, in, in those sense, it, there was nothing that, uh, you know, there was nothing special about that 2008, 2009 timeframe. Um, like all of those ingredients had been set up. You could argue that extreme was a big, that, you know, was pretty much the thing that 
tipped um, people down that road. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it's like one of those things when you look at it, you're like, oh, yeah, it seems so obvious in hindsight. And it was pretty straightforward, you know, small and frequent changes for, these, for this reasoning, and uh, you'd need these to do this sort of straightforward, but it, it was a perspective shift. I mean, you, I think my, my guess is that both of you were, were there to sort of see this perspective shift, light bulbs go on. Um, the, that's the what's per, happening. The perspective shift is not evenly distributed. <laughs> You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, and so, yeah. So, so how does, um, when we talk about resilience engineering and cognitive systems engineering, um, can we talk a little bit about the work that how you applied that, maybe not at Yahoo, but afterwards and stuff and tease that out a little bit? Because the thing that actually sprung into my mind was um, how we tried almost to automate that in software with things like uh, chaos engineer, chaos monkey and thing, things like mm -hmm. that, like, which doesn't take mm -hmm. into consideration the human factor at all. It's just like, let's, well, it tries to simulate it, but there's no, hum it's like, running test after test after test and and doing this yeah. crazy to your website and stuff so like can you pull that up tease that out a little bit more yeah 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 so uh, actually I'll, i want to um i'll um uh i'll comment a little bit on what you sort of what you what you just mentioned um uh, uh, with respect to chaos engineering as kind of an example of um of how sort of application could look. So um, myself, Nora Jones, Casey Rosenthal, there are, um, and, and, and others, um, matter of fact, they have a, there's a new book um, at, uh, from O'Reilly on, on chaos engineering, has pointed out actually that the, um, uh, certainly one perspective is the one that you described. Another perspective is that the, uh, that the creation of a uh, of a chaos experiment, uh, the process and practice, the the, the 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 dialogue that generates um, where, how, when an experiment ought to be uh, ought to be performed, can be as valuable, if sometimes even more valuable, than actually running the experiment. In which case, this is a capture of cognitive work. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, so the the you know uh, what I would say is, uh, um, matter of fact, actually, I uh, because I was uh, I was just reading. Let me just read this here. Uh, um, uh, Nora Jones this is an, in, in an interview that Nora gave you. Jones also states that before and after of running a chaos experiment is as important as running the experiment it's, itself. Um, and so the you know the how does how does the application of of, of cognitive systems engineering look? Um, well, I'd say the, the first real sort of application was in my master's thesis, which is to understand what ru what rules of thumb or heuristics engineers use when trying to resolve and understand and respond to outages, especially when signals, as we know, can be disparate, sometimes contradicting, sometimes not make much sense. In, uh, in, when faced with an entire um, um, you know, sea or, or almost in, infinite number of places to look, you have to look, you, have to, you start looking somewhere. What leads you to look in some places rather than other places? And so this is a this is the study of cognitive work. My thesis, which you're happy to download in case you're having difficulty <laughs> sleeping, um, uh, um, will sort of go into in, into detail there. I would say the significant um, um, uh, work is uh, if you were to um, if I were to give you a couple of threads to pull on. Um, if you were to if you were to uh, look into methods, techniques, uh, approaches, and it's an entire family um, uh, of, um, uh, of of um, of things that make up what's known as cognitive task analysis. Cognitive task analysis is uh, more or less the the the, sort of the formalized method with r related uh, cognitive work analysis, CTA and CWA. 
And um, all of these tips and tricks that go into that is the application of cognitive systems engineering. You can think of those are the tools to understand how people understand and how people wrestle with, um, both cooperatively uh, in, in teams and also individually, um, uh, problems that they're, that they're facing, problems that they're anticipating, and what those problems in uh, anticipation or in, 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 uh, in responding to what they mean. Um, and, and what comes out of that is this closer look. And that what we what we always like to say is, look, the expertise is coming from inside the house. There's I, I much like more, you. yeah, there's much more to understand about how people do their, their work than is represented in JIRA. I, I would add there's a tendency in, in all of these uh, practices, especially when you're kind of outside of the, the core conversations to focus on the the tools because it, you see it as a concrete representation of what's happening but in my mental model and, and the conversations i've had with some of the people you just mentioned i feel like the the core chaos engineering community and, and you know the stuff we're talking about with cognitive engineering resilience engineering like those are essentially inseparable in my in my head yeah absolutely and the, what I, what's exciting about chaos engineering is not only the original, um, you know, a lot of the sort of, um, you know, proponents, uh, the, even the earliest proponents of, of chaos engineering um, uh, are, are seeing this connection and they're seeing this connection in, in ways that is, for me, really satisfying. Um, and I'm, I'm, they're making new connections that is uh, uh, between resilience engineering and chaos engineering. Um, that I had, I wouldn't have even seen. And so that's really satisfying, super um, happy about that. Someone just dropped something in the chat that, that remind me of some of the stuff I've seen you talk about before that, that might be fun to articulate here, which is, yeah. is this notion of the, the kind of the, the lines of our models and, and how the, the process of incidents and, and analyzing them helps us build clearer models. Uh, yeah, speak to yeah. So, interesting points. Yeah, yeah, this um, this notion of this line of representation, it's a bit of a mind blower, right? So uh, the, um, and this is uh, entirely from the, uh, um, uh, worked out in the Snafu Catchers Consortium and um, is described in a lot more detail. I'm not gonna be as much as eloquent um, uh, here, but in the Stella report, um, describes this sort of frame. And the frame, the frame goes like this. We have all of the stuff, the technical, We've got the databases, we have, you know, we've got the thing that we build. Here's the thing that generates, you know, that users use it to generate revenue. Here's the stuff that we, that, we, that we build and maintain to help us build that thing, right? And here, and, and all of the things that sort of intertwine with that, including like dependencies and all this stuff. So we've got all this stuff that, that sort of fits together, databases and code repositories and networks and firewalls and all of this stuff. Um, that's that stuff we manipulate that stuff we do things with that stuff via a representation of that stuff it's not with the stuff right when you go to make a, a schema change you don't go to the data center and do a thing physically to the database right and 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 what, what and so what we everything we know about that world is via these representations. They're not the things, they're representations of those things, right? Uh, distributed tracing app is a representation. To the extent that it's useful, it is a representation. It's not the thing, it's not, it's, it's not you know, it's, it, it's not the thing that you hold, you know, you can look at it and say, oh, well, there's, there's that. And what that means is that people's ability to not only make changes, but also anticipate uh, um, anticipate uh, what the system might do in the future, and uh, where it came and is based on where it came from. All comes it comes from nowhere except for their mental model of the, the, uh, of the, the world. The world. The work we do is both facilitated and limited by, by these mental models that we've built up about what we're working on. 
Yes, yes, exactly. And so what should surprise, and, 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 and in addition to that, what incidents and what, what close, close study of incidents shows is that no one has the identical mental model of the same book is below the line stuff as others. They may have some that are close. They may have more. They may have more detail in some areas than others. And what's happening is that teams are continually recalibrating these mental models through discussions with other other um, with others, through looking at, at 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 dashboards, looking through code, writing new code, seeing how that behaves, and that it's in this constant recalibration. So we have overlapping mental models, the, but and so what's surprising is they're never complete. They're always faulty in some way and stuff works almost all the time despite that and the reason why it does is because only people can adapt and recalibrate that mental model it's not the stuff below the line it's not the there's no intelligence that goes down there other than what what have what has come from us um, and it's not the below the line stuff that's doing it, right? It's, it's our ability to make sense of what's happening, what's happened in the past, what's happened, what's happening right now, what makes that, um, matter and what makes what might matter in the future important to pay attention to. And so that's the, the notion of above the line, below the line. So that, and to go back to something early, very early in this conversation, the, you know, the blame game. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and I come from a perspective of open source community development and trying to, you know, shed sunlight. And so when there is an incident, um, mm -hmm. and you, we have one team has their mental model of how things are working. One of the things that I try really hard and is almost is very hard to get people to do is to share their model. Um, it's almost mm -hmm. a cultural shift because. It, often it's inside, it's something that went wrong with a product or a service or something like that. Flickr went down or, you know, somebody went down. Um, and they're very reluctant to, like, have an open dialogue with the user community about um, what went wrong because then maybe they'll ship to another service provider or, sure. you know, something like that. So there's this, and I'm just wondering maybe from both of your perspectives, you know, how you help companies and organizations understand that putting some sunlight on your mental model or your, your model um, might, uh, and, and exposing them, sharing them with people on how to do that effectively and allow other opinions, because uh, going back to where the innovation happens is those aha moments um, of, oh, yeah, often come from outside perspective. So. I, I want to add um, before John go, goes back to answering the question for real that this this occurs at, at several layers and levels as well. So e internally, uh, there, there's often uh, you know, and this is people talk about job security, or whatever. People will will protect the mental model that they've constructed and not share it internally, and and, and then that you know also happens between between teams, between departments, and then as you mentioned externally. But in, at the same time, I feel, you know, in the Velocity Conference and the community around DevOps days and the rest of that over the last decade or so ha has, has essentially uh, started making postmortems or incident analysis publicly uh, into an art form. So I'll let, I'll let John make his comments on that. But this, yeah. doesn't, this, yeah. this, this isn't just between the organization and the outside. We, we protect our mental yeah. models on several scales. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and and to the you know to your observation, Dan, that there's that there can sometimes be reluctance, right, uh, to giving. I wouldn't say sharing mental models because um, um, I can I might make a a, a a point about that, but really even just um, uh, really relaying any sort of information about what was ha what was yeah. happening for Do them we, at the time, we, right? Yeah. Doing a public postmortem on something that's a very bit a public service outage or something like that. Sure, often sure. Huge reluctance from engineering teams to do that, and that's um, sure. The, but, uh, it, 
sometimes. Well, uh, well, I mean, so, well, you, I mean, it is, right? Um, if they believe that they would get something from it, they would do it. If they believe that, that, that and this is internal and uh, just like, just like Andrew said, and external, there's nothing, there's some, uh, you know, peculiarities about, um, uh, in, uh, uh, um, you know, write-ups about incidents to the public. But remember, those are, those are uh, um, the purpose of those, the audience for those is very different than an internal, right? And, the, and, and to mistake the two as being similar is different. The point that you brought up, which is reluctance, um, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a reason why there's that, that people are reluctant, right? If they think that they can get something, if they think there's something positive and they feel supported in giving a story, uh, then great. If there's if there's something that is uh, potentially threatening um, for them uh, or others, then then they won't, right? Um, and so uh, remember the the and and just the somewhat of a uh, potentially nitpicky point on on mental models is that peak, I can't ask you for your mental model. You can't give it to me. You can't. You can tell me. You can tell me a story from uh, um from uh, um uh, uh, from a uh, cognitive uh, uh, technique when i when you ask somebody something uh, about how they um, uh, rationalize right um something called reflexivity you will give the answer that you think that the asker the 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 requester will 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 give um uh, you have to build a constellation of data that supports uh, this mental model calibration, recalibration. And you have to, and, and that's a, both a mixture of, uh, of, of records of what people do, what people say, and what people do and say about what they do and said, including others. This is called process tracing, but it's the way that you can do, uh, way you can make ever valid inferences about cognitive processes. Sorry to get really nerdy there for a second, but this is the reason why, uh, you know, this is, this is what makes um, doing this work difficult. Um, uh, people won't share a thing that they think everybody knows, or they aren't even aware of themselves. Um, a famous, uh, uh, a famous researcher in this in, in in the late '60s said it quite quite best about tacit knowledge. Uh, we can know more than we can tell, and uh, and and a significant part of studying cognitive work is exploring tacit knowledge. And there are some ways that you simply cannot do it, and you have to learn to how you have to learn and practice how to do that. Um, otherwise, the results aren't valid, and there's only one thing worse than a really poorly captured incident write-up, and that is an incident write-up that every everyone, despite its contents, finds to be uh, non-credible because the authors and the methods by which that was that was formed is seen to have an agenda to. Uh, the, the effective incident analysis requires an analyst to be a non-stakeholder, full stop, full period. There is no other alternative. You need to have no stake, no dog in that fight, no horse in that race about what the analysis does other than provide others uh, a, uh, it, a boundary it, object, a source of dialogue. Isn't that exceedingly difficult to have no agenda? This is why Adaptive Capacity Labs is an expensive professional service. If it was, if it was easy, we'd already be doing it. You know, what's the difference between? The, the, there's a reason why. And let me let me be let me. I'm going to be super blunt here. The world of human factors. It's been said. My. Many colleagues uh, of, of, of mine now have said this. Um, the origins of cognitive systems engineering, uh, human factors, all the stuff that we're talking about 
a definitely cognitive task analysis. Um, uh, the reason why a lot of this comes out of research in the military, DOD and DOE funded projects in the US and, 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 um, and, and other parts of the, uh, of the world uh, is because of the, because of consequences and time pressure. And uh, it's, you know, it's jokingly said that um, you, you're, you're doing this work either because somebody uh, who was supposed to get killed didn't, or somebody got killed who shouldn't have. And, um, and, and that wipes away consequence and time pressure, wipes away anything else that is immaterial. That's what makes incidents. That's the Trojan horse. We think, you know, that it's a myth to say that, that using these techniques, looking into inc incident analysis isn't there. It, you, the, the focus isn't necessarily to find what broke. It's not a, some, it's not some sort of socialized debugging. It's to find out how stuff works at all. The incident is just a director of attention. The incident is just the, you know, the filter, um, you know, and you could think of an incident as your system saying, hey, everybody, you just, hey, everybody, listen, you really ought to come pay attention. There's something, this doesn't work the way you think it does. You should come, right? It's incredibly efficient. It's very efficient in that way. Um, and so it's we're the just- opportunity. It's the opportunity. Yeah, if you see the has, incident as the opportunity. Exactly, exactly. And to that, I would say, uh, um, uh, people who don't have the skills on how to do it are only gonna get so much out of spending an hour in a, in a conference room filling out a template. Sorry, the, slightly the, snarky. The, the, the other thing, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say the other thing is that a good incident report or a good postmortem doesn't necessarily tell you what caused the incident. It just gives other people information that they can can help you um, sift through and maybe sparks a conversation that gets you to that opportunity. Yes, and in order to do that, it needs to be compelling for the broadest audience in the deepest ways possible. Mm -hmm. Engineers need, and I mean, this is something we know about software engineers. They don't read anything they don't think they need to read. And when they think they need to read something and they have an expectation they're going to get something out of it, you're damn right they're going to read it. And so doing that, capturing what makes incidents hard, capturing what makes, you know, red herrings and wild goose chases happen because following those have worked in the past, mm -hmm. right? But you never, you, you very rarely see the details of red herrings and what made red herrings so attractive to follow in incident write-ups. It's very, very, very rarely do you see that. That's an example of something. That's an example of the messy details. That's really important. The, the other outcome of doing postmortems and insert reports um, is also building trust. Um, when you share that information, you're building trust with the other folks across silos internally or your end user community that you're sharing this information as opposed to withholding it and um, not um, exposing, you know, the, the, the things that might have led up to it. So there's, so I, you know, and, and the hardest thing is to do it well. And, and I well, think that's, that's, yeah, that's, this is proportional and you're right about trust, but, but that trust is proportional to the quality and, uh, uh what others find of interest in the report, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why I'd say one of a, a very strong signal, not the signal, but a very strong signal, um, is how many people read. How many people read it? You know, how many, if, if you can't, and, and I'm going to go out on a limb. I know that counting uh, and doing statistics on how often somebody has visited a web page is a solved problem. Their entire, there's, I know of a company who's built their entire business on that. Um, but yet, if, you know, the, the way to build, the way to break trust is to, is to make available all your incident write-ups that are terrible. Mm -hmm. 
and, and it's a skill right. to do to do good ones. It's a skill, and it, it shouldn't be done lightly. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know. well, I, I think in in a lot of organizations, it's a mandated perfunctory action, and that, that's I think yes. the problem that, that John's trying to expose. That we're we're kind of coming towards the top of the hour, and given the fact that not everyone has has John Allspa on retainer at this point, uh, what kind of what kind of practical advice? would you give to someone listening about where to start, where to explore, you know, what can they do that, that would make some maybe meaningful um, changes to their own mental model, not necessarily about their systems, but about this type of work? Yeah, that's great. For the record, um, if everyone was interested in having me on retainer, certainly please reach out. Um, <laughs> uh, the, um, so that, that that is a great question. So there's there there are two things that I would um, I would suggest. Uh, the first is uh, to understand that there's a growing community who is who is it's not just adaptive trust you labs right. Um, uh, there's a website called Learning from Incidents. You will see reflected in a lot of blog posts more and more people talking about these um, these topics. I'm happy to sort of um, tweet much more. I'll say that the, the learning from incidents um, page, and in particular, uh, Lauren Hochstein on GitHub has, has, has written an absolutely stunning sort of a set of resources about resilience engineering and understanding cognitive work um, that you can look at. Um, pragmatically, practically, a uh, couple of suggestions. The first is to make effort to capture from as many people as you can, um, what was difficult? Ask them. At, put it put it in a news put it in a news section in your postmortem template or wherever you want it, and get people to uh, to write what was hard, what was surprising, what was difficult. Um, the more people, and uh, not not what they thought the team thought was difficult not in an abstract way, individual perspectives, individual perceptions. What was hard, what was difficult. The more that you can, uh, um, and lots of things are difficult. It's not just sometimes even, uh, even understanding the thing that you're seeing is bad can be difficult. Um, uh, and so, um, gathering those sorts of reflections, right? Every, every engineer has this feeling, this, this um, sort of, when we've, we, we talk with organizations, uh, we, I, I, I'll ask, have you ever, you know, have you ever about to run a command? You're responding to an incident, you're about to run a command. And everybody thinks you should do this, right? All your colleagues are like, you should do this. This looks like it's the best shot. Okay, all right, I'm gonna go do it. Have you ever had that feeling that right before you hit enter, there's an equal chance that this might make things worse? Mm -hmm. Well, on right? a regular basis. That's a palpable, extremely important experience that almost never finds its way into these narratives. Capturing what makes work hard, what makes work harrowing, uh, uh, um, you know, absolutely uh, uh, astonishing uh, you know there are there are surprises that are absolutely fundamental right there, there's a, this notion of uh, of of a uh, a situational surprise that's when you buy a lottery ticket and you win the lottery right and then there's fundamental surprise and that's when you don't buy a lottery ticket and you win the lottery okay fundamental surprises are what make Chernobyl, they make uh, the, the BATS IPO, they make Knight Capital, they make a Three Mile Island, um, uh, they make, they make uh, accidentally sending uh, a, a, a ballistic missile alarm to the entire state of Hawaii. Um, uh, and so, so capture that, that's my pragmatic advice, capture that stuff, put it down, people will read it because they've been in that situation. How do you, what do you think about that? I think I could sit and talk to you all day. Uh, Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Well, 
We'll definitely have you back. I, I think there's a, a piece that, that I'd also like to tease out is because, and again, um, Andrew's like maybe focused on organizational change and transformation and DevOps stuff. And, and I kind of have, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to apply this to some of the open source communities that we're helping um, support. Mm -hmm. Because doing this in open, transparent processes, as opposed to maybe in an enterprise process, which is very, very important because I'm sitting inside of, you know, good old Red Hat and, um, you know, this stuff happens all the time. And I mean, we do have a, a, a great engineering team and they, you know, and they have read all of the books and, you know, they've done, and they actually apply a lot of this stuff. So it's, it's great. It's been wonderful. But then when we take it and we have to do it in the open. Um, yeah. And, and when I talk about sharing that, you know, you know, how we do this in, in an open, positive way and, and learning the practices um, in open source communities, which is something that now that I've, I've read the books and now I've heard you speak and I've heard Andrew speak and everybody and everybody's is trying to figure out how to take this to the open source community work that we're doing. Very sounds like a, a challenge. Yeah, that sounds like an yeah, that sounds like an amazing and excellent challenge. An excellent, an excellent topic. But cool. Um, and we are at the top of the hour, um, and uh, I, we're going to hit a button soon and end this conversation. And that's going to make you know a fundamental um, issue for all of us because we'd love to. It have doesn't you. have to end the conversation. You can reach out to us on LinkedIn or Twitter or what have you. Yeah, and we'll I'll continue try and... the conversation, but just we'll just end it for the day. Yeah, and I'll try and find um, many of the references that you spoke of, the both of you spoke of, um, and and add them to a resources page for this uh, this conversation when we post it up. Um, and definitely have you back again. And boy, um, lots of things to think about now over the weekend and ongoing. So thank you very much for joining us today. I, I, I'm I'm very happy to, to talk with you, Diane. And uh, I um, I always love talking with you, Andrew. <laughs>